so thanks very much for coming. As you see, I have lots of candy up here. <laughs> I will not promise uh, anything uh, even slightly being any good at aiming. Um, so if I throw some candy at you, it's either because you've fallen asleep or you've answered the question right. So, you know, you could try both, um, but my aim is very bad, so the neighbor next to you might get a hit, so I apologize now. Um, so for, um, just let the last couple of people dribble in. Hello. Okay, fantastic. Um, so quick introduction um, of who I am. Um, for those that signed up to the meetup, uh, if this is not who we're expecting to speak, you're probably at the wrong venue. <laughs> but you got some free food out of it, so that's always good. Um, so I'm, um, as, as the sign says, my name is Irina Chu. Um, I don't look Chinese. I married a Chinese man. That's always one thing that I always get from clients. I thought we were just Chinese. Um, unless I've been an experienced designer now for 15 years. So I'm quite old. I know, makeup, makeup does wonders. Um, but I've been helping brands like Nike, Aviva, um, AstraZeneca, Barclays, and many more in, in the space of kind of um, product innovation and helping them scale their design practices. Um, predominantly for those particular um, clients, we've used design systems, but obviously we've worked in a lot of other areas as well. Um, so today, as uh, some of you will know, we're going to be talking a little bit about product innovation. And from my perspective, I think product re innovation really isn't a magic talent. It's, it's, it's just a craft. Um, and just like wizards, it's just about using the right tools and, and giving you the opportunity to spend time innovating rather than just pixel pushing. Um, so in this talk, I'm hoping um, that by the end of it, you'll be able to kind of see how innovation can happen if you just disrupt the way that you do things. Um, and if I'm not successful, uh, there's feedback forms throughout the walls, uh, but I'm hoping it'll be good and bad feedback. Um, always room for improvement. Um, before I generally start my talks, especially because obviously I'm a designer and this is considered a tech talk, um, who here is not a developer or a technologist of somewhere? Okay. So quite a few, quite a few, good, good. Um, but here at ThoughtWorks, we do truly believe in kind of that cross-pollination of ideas from other fields that aren't typically um, the field that you work in. Because at the end of the day, it makes you a better anything, be it a developer or a designer. And we often use the, the quote from um, Michael Fathers, who's a, who's a really, really awesome author. If you haven't read that book, you really should pick it up. Um, and he kind of says there's a lot of knowledge outside of our field to, that will help us kind of look at problems in a very different ways um, and help us to kind of take those frames um, and apply them to, to other parts of our world. So who here is ready to look at product innovation in a different way? Good. There we go. Now you guys catch. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Good. Now you see how this works. Uh, so what is product innovation? Well, the nature of innovation is, in my view, is wildly misunderstood because innovation is rarely pure uh, innovation, so like invention. It's not, it's not about, um, it, it's about making better interac interactions with what has come before. So you look at Apple, right? Apple, did they invent the MP3? Did they invent the smartphone? David Bowie, did he invent glam rock? Careful, I'm a Debbie Bowie fan. <laughs> no, he didn't. Um, Google didn't invent the first uh, web search. And Elon Musk, even though he might pretend that he did, he certainly didn't invent the electric cars. And in all of these cases, it's really just that they took the existing, something that was already existing and just kind of did it better. And it wasn't just about evolution. It's truly about looking outside of the scope and the realm of that particular product and getting influences from the outer world and making it better. So what is innovation if it's not pure invention? And, and we use this quote because it kind of comes up with two different points. One is around utilizing unique ex assets. So in our world, it could be the technical skills that you have, but then also looking at um, the strength of solving the problem in a new and novel way. So I talk a little bit about the curiosity and the ability for you to um, 
frame problems in different lights. So the three uh, steps of innovation, and by all means, if you Google the internet, you will find a thousand different ways of innovation. Um, and I think at the crux of it, innovation is a creative process, but if you use certain tools, you, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll sound like a broken record by the end of it, but at the crux of it, innovation is just about reframing the, the, the world around you. As developers, you, you look at a particular code problem and it isn't until you kind of step away and go, where else have I seen this kind of pattern that you are likely to um, solve that problem in a, in a new way. I keep looking down on the floor because this cable's in front of me, so I apologize if I um, trip and make a fool of myself. Um, so in terms of the, the three steps, I think from my perspective, the next time you kind of face a challenge, I challenge you to kind of stop and reframe it. And what do I mean by reframing it? It's really about rethinking the problem statement. You know, break it down into its small parts and unpack all of your assumptions. So if we take the example of, um, so I'm, I'm a rugby fan, a New Zealander by heart. Um, and if I were to redesign the, the helmets of rugby players or the, the um, headgear of the helmet of the um, rugby players, typically I would look at things like design in terms of ergonomics, but also in terms of um, protecting you against um, knocks to, to your brain. And how we would go about kind of reframing that is to look at the outside world. So what would be a typical um, animal, right? So we've got woodpeckers. They're woodpeckers chomp away at the tree every single day, yet they don't have any brain injuries. And what is it about woodpeckers that is so different from our brain or the way that they're made? And then you take those insights and that knowledge and you start to apply it into your design practice. But also it helps you kind of unpack those assumptions because typically we go, oh, well, this is how we're made or this is the fabrics that we have. And, and it isn't until you look outside that you kind of go, maybe that assumption wasn't quite right. And then by breaking those into small parts, you can really start to focus on the elements that you understand best. And, and this is where I was saying about kind of looking at the more you know, um, at, the, better, the better you are, right? So you, you get the idea, you cross-pollinate your knowledge base with very uh, unusual things, and suddenly you're able to kind of take in that knowledge to any problem statement and go, hmm, okay, we could try, um, you know, the um, open banking API model on, um, you know, biometric management or things like that. And by really centering on what you know, you can much more readily identify the resources that you have around you and, uh, and what you can do to, to have it work to form a solution. Um, so in a, in a recent chat to Airbnb, they said something really interesting where they said, um, there's a simple truth that you cannot innovate on products without first innovating on the way you build them. And the reason why that is, is uh, you know, we're looking at being able to try and keep up to date with the rest of the industry out there. Um, and from a design perspective, it means that we need to learn how to design it at scale. And the problem with scale is really that as delivery and design teams kind of grow and, and aligning people to deliver these great customer experience starts to become this constant challenge, opposing challenge, because let's face it, making great things is hard. Um, and making great things in large organizations or enterprises is even harder. But it happens though, like there are companies out there, there's organizations like um, GE and IBM and, and the Airbnb model that you saw before, and even Microsoft have managed to kind of scale their ability to create an on-the-fly product that can be prototyped and tested and iterated at a pace that just eclipses, eclipses their, their competitors. But the one thing that I found interesting that they have in common is, um, is the fact that they have design systems, right? Because at the end of the day, design systems kind of unify um, design and, design and um, developer efforts and make it easier for you to ship great customer experience. Because at the end of the day, everyone in the team wants to focus on creating more meaningful work. Design systems for me are really like a paved road through really, really rough terrain um, because teams can go at it alone. Um, but it's slow and it's hard and it doesn't get easier the next time you, you, you need to go through it. 
And so when I looked at kind of trying to find out with a more meaningful um, definition of what system design or design systems were, I found it really frustrating because everything that I read online, it was just about repeatable components. It was just about atomic design and buttons and UI and placements of this and carousels of that. And, and to me, it's become abundantly clear that um, it, is, it goes beyond just the repeatable components. It's just the starting point because an advanced design system or the systems that have worked um, for, for the clients that we've worked with need to kind of encompass this entire design platform. So we're talking tools, we're talking, yeah, we're talking UI, we're talking app components, but we're talking code libraries and content libraries and data analytics and documentation and workflow. It isn't just about creating componentized designs and code. And as we know, um, <laughs> There are certain uh, benefits to having um, design systems. Um, I could kind of, I, I pause here because when I was originally creating this deck, I was talking to a designer about, you know, what kind of content should I include? And it feels often as if we become evangelists of design systems primarily because it makes our life easier. But at the end of the day, for me, it's kind of become about this consistent, being able to, con to create a consistent customer experience and to be able to kind of collaborate with the developers, the product owners, the, even just you know, the analytics team um, and enabling us to build products faster but making, by making designs reusable and uh, kind of scaling much quicker. Um, it, and from a design lead, I think for me the caliber of my design team has Ro risen exponentially because now we've kind of gotten to a point where we have this kind of reduced misunderstandings or misinterpretations that gap between what I as a designer aspire and what developers end up developing and uh, please don't take it as an uh, I'm not trying to offend developers because I think sometimes what we say or what we draw versus what you envision can often be um, misinterpreted. Um, so we, we end up reducing the time spent redesigning the same old patterns. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming a few of you guys have worked on projects where someone has gone, oh, well, we need a, a feed for something or we need a payments page or a success page or an error page and even just basic 404 pages, the number of times that it, I've had clients come up to me going, oh, we need a 404 page, can you design it for me? I'm like, there's a design library for that. Um, wh why am I wasting my time? With, with something as meaningless as that. Um, but most importantly for me, kind of design systems have helped the organization do more with its resources, right? So we're creating, we're creating connected experiences much quicker. And, and it's enabled some of our smaller clients to really start acting like technology companies, right? So you look at, um, there's a really interesting um, bread bakery manufacturing place. So originally it was just a bakery and they decided they were going to start um, selling their produce online. And in the space of three years, they went from not having a website to making over one billion US dollars in profits. And that was all through the creation of a website. And they were able to kind of keep growing it at such a pace that it allowed them to make horrendous amounts of profits. Um, but the efficiency that I keep talking about um, kind of allows us in an agile, rapid, continuous delivery model to, um, to kind of be able to support our delivery teams to, pro to, to produce and deliver at that pace. So who here works in agile? Agile, yeah. Who here has no idea what agile is? Good, because I was about to show you the room. Um, so next door we have uh, lots and lots of uh, books with the agile methodology. Um, but what does that mean? Sorry, yeah, go for it. Uh, design system, would you mind explaining what exactly do we mean by design system? Um, so, as I was saying before, I think it's a collection of patterns uh, as well as tools and processes underneath to support the creation of fast um, design and delivery of designs. Design for products? 
design, design for products. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so does that mean that everyone needs an, its own design system? Does it? Yes? No? No? Oh, oh look! I threw it straight into her arms. Uh, my rugby days are not over. Yes. It's like I primed her. You know, we don't work together, right? Um, yeah, so my point was going to be, you know, like, let's get real. There are some companies that really don't need their own design systems, right? Especially where um, owning your brand isn't mission critical. So you look at um, products that offer experiences rather than um, brand recognition. Um, and, and also kind of if your team is small and you just don't have the bandwidth, then you might as well use all of the already out of the box design systems out there um, under the caveat that, um, you know, if you reach out to things like uh, Google Material, um, Microsoft, or even Apple, um, it is just a design library, right? So the nuances to design systems is how do I go about implementing these processes that help me continuing to grow this library, that help me continue to collaborate, that help me to understand as a developer, when do I use carousel one, two, three versus carousel four, five, six? And how do these components or these buttons or these contents, how do they kind of interact with each other? Because it's not just about a cookie cutter approach, otherwise everyone would just create their websites in, in, in Wix or WordPress or whatever, dare I say that word. Um, but if you are looking at these particular three um, readily usable um, design systems, I'd say Google Material, from my experience, tends to be the more well-supported and universal design system. Um, Microsoft Fluent, it's kind of great for emerging interfaces, so if you're doing something that's cool and up and coming, um, definitely have a look at them. Um, Apple uh, Human Interface Guidelines, they're really, really good from us, from, from a designer perspective. We use them a lot in referencing um, our rationale for designs. Um, they're very deep, they're very detailed, but they do primarily focus on app design, which is no surprise given. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you plan into design? You suggest that prototyping is a good thing creating biofilms, getting the people and the early design. So even, um, even th so we use design systems as part of prototyping as well. Um, so behind all of the um, design systems that we have, uh, and I think I go through it, do I? Um, I? I'll go through into it a little bit more detail, but um, essentially design systems isn't just about us saying this is what a um, carousel looks like, but we also have the codes behind it, the interactions behind it, the rationale behind it, when you use it, how you use it, because um, looking at something versus understanding the context and the meaning behind it can be very, very different. So let's say you do need to own, uh, or you decide to kind of go down the route of um, creating your own design systems. And, you know, we work with a lot of clients over the time and have kind of helped them either set up or consult or kind of um, apply existing design systems to their new products. And some of the more common things that we've seen is initially this enthusiasm and energy for like, yes, let's do design systems is always there um, up front, but then they kind of realize how hard it is. Um, because design systems isn't just a, oh, I'm going to create this thing over here and once it's done, that's it, I can move on. Um, it, it's gonna be something that's going to forever kind of evolve, unfortunately. But in terms of some of the, the kind of the five key lessons that we've learned from the delivery of design systems with our clients is, um, and I always start with focus on people and processes. Again, because you know, to your point, it isn't just about creating the library, it's about how do you um, help the design system become more efficient and help the organization focus on the culture and the processes like sharing and collaborating. Um, how do you create a system that kind of meets where the user needs are. So for example, as me as a designer, I don't want to have to go to a website to copy and paste the component. I want to be able to do it inside my tool. So from um, 
some of the previous clients we've worked with Sketch. Sketch has a really interesting um, um, integrated tool that allows you to kind of pull in component libraries. Um, but the reason why people and processes are important is because from my perspective, every single client is different. So we kind of throw away the rule book um, and we just focus on supporting really intelligent teams to learn what works in the context of the organization. Because if I go, here's the one, two, three, four, five tools that you use, and here's the processes that you need to implement, depending on the size of your team, the politics in your team, um, or even just the budget, um, it'll get to a point where you're like, well, that just doesn't work. It's over-engineered for me. Um, and talking about the over-engineered, you know, don't just don't go too far ahead of yourself. Build a design system that kind of allows you to grow as fast as the product that it is that you're developing. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of get wrapped up in this aspirational lofty goals of creating the next uh, material design. Have people heard about material design here? Yes, a few nods. People are too scared to put up their hands in case I throw chocolate at their faces. <laughs> right, good. Um, but, you know, like sometimes just reality gets in the way, right? So you, we find resources hard enough to um, justify on our projects, the time and budget. So if you start small and you evolve over time, it really allows the, the design system to kind of feel like a living, breathing thing rather than just something that's going to collect dust over the time. Um, I kind of talk about using design systems or managing design systems in the service life cycle inside an organization. And what I mean by that is to kind of look at um, how do people adopt design systems? It's something new to your organization. How do you educate someone about what it is and how do I come on board um, to, to um, you know, start using this? What if I don't um, you know, have any developers? What if I don't uh, understand it? Do you provide the support? Do you provide the education? So just looking at it like a product life cycle will allow you to um, start creating some much more meaningful processes behind it. Uh, leadership support. Who here kind of talks to leaderships quite regularly? Yep, there's a few of you. And how much of their time do you typically get? Very little. Very little, yeah. And I think that scenario whereby there's 20 things that they need to get done today, 10 of which move the business forwards and only two of you, only two of them can be done, is kind of very familiar, right? Because with the limited resources in a world where urgency kind of drives the important, it's really easy for us to lose sight of um, what we should be doing in favor of what needs to be done. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so having kind of that evangelist at a senior stakeholder level helps you pave the way to, to, take, to let your design system take root. And that's really the hard part of this equation for me. Um, I've talked a little bit about this, about it being kind of both design and technology, because it kind of works best when developers, technologists, designers, system analysts, whatever, when they start using a common language. Um, it, it brings them into the process. Um, and I don't know, again, it depends on your organization, but in ours, everyone here is a technologist, everyone here is a designer, it doesn't matter what your title is, because at the end of the day, creativity is in everything that we do. And by bringing people together with this common language, you create something great around what is best, the best way forward. Um, in terms of kind of technology systems, there's real um, an an importance for you to kind of create an infrastructure that is flexible for reuse. Um, you know, a library of modules, components for everyone to use, um, but it's the integration from end to end that will help you succeed. Um, invest in the right tools and processes, you know, make things easy for me to get. Um, I've talked a little bit about Sketch. Um, Envision does really, really good integration with Sketch um, to allow you to kind of take some of these these tools and prototype really quickly, right? So um, the craft, um, Envision has the craft plugin and it, they kind of, they sell themselves as the single source of truth in a design system um, and rightfully so, don't get me wrong, but 
and as a designer, what I often feel like is missing is that integration from there into then, let's say, taking it into Zeppelin or taking it into GitHub or, you know, that kind of full end-to-end -end experience because at the end of the day, it doesn't stop the moment that I finish my designs. Um, and for me, it's not just about the tools. It's kind of about the process. Um, and that's always changing, right? So it's, it's only like yesterday that we were applying responsive design, or was it adaptive, whichever one. Um, but we're kind of creating websites with teams, right? So surely teams, as teams change, as we evolve, we should be streamlining the tools and the processes that we use in order to help us um, better scale the things that we do. Do we have any questions? I've kind of taken enough of your drinks time. Um, yeah. Just regarding, oh. you, you were always talking about designers and developers and mm 